Radical, episode 114. Ladies and gents, welcome to Radical. I'm your host, Shane Hazel. Thank you guys for uh, coming in and being with us tonight. I got a great guest. We've been trying to get this uh, together for, it feels like, months now. Uh, He is a truck driver extraordinaire, and I I mean, I can't wait to talk about this a little bit, but uh, he's also making a big, 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 big push in uh, the libertarian movement right now. He's uh, he's got his own podcast. Uh, and uh, he's just generally, I think the more I, I understand of this man, I think he's just one of these guys that has taken a whole lot of information, digested it, it got off his ass, and he's doing something about it. And I absolutely am tickled to death uh, to give you guys my guest tonight, Mr. Reed Coverdale. Welcome to the show, sir. Thanks, Shane. Uh, boy, I've got to update my intro because yours blows mine out of the water. That's that's an amazing <laughs> intro there, man. <laughs> hey, man, uh, the, the, the system is down. Uh, you can check them out uh, every time, man. Uh, yeah, anytime somebody says something, it's just like, uh, I got I got to plug my boy. But uh, yeah, uh, the system is down. Go check him out. Uh, he's got some really nice work out there, high energy, and it's exactly what we need. But you're joining us from the cab of the great American uh, truck podcast. I think, I mean, seriously, you got to be one of the the biggest names in trucking podcasts right now, right? I think I'm the only libertarian trucker who like live streams from the cab. I'm not sure. I mean, there might be someone else who does it, but I'm the only (laughs) one who who video streams on YouTube from the cab that I know of. So it's a pretty easy niche to monopolize on really quickly. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I was gonna say, man, and I mean, and look at what you've done. I mean, you've you've come into this space and really, uh, I don't want to say, sh- you know, just shaking it up, but I mean, you're being met with just a, a lot of love and reverence, and, and I think it's one of the coolest things in the world. Why do you think that is? Well, I do have to give a lot of credit to Dave Smith. He's a good friend to have. You know, he's he makes accessibility <laughs> and publicity pretty easy. So there's a lot uh, having to do with Dave, but um, I. I don't know. I try to uh, focus on the big issues and focus on what brings us together and um, try to get people to think. And um, I think there's so much divisiveness and there's been so much tribalism in the liberty movement. And tribalism is a result of not thinking and not talking to people that you have disagreements with. So the idea of uh, breaking down these uh, tribal walls we've built and trying to talk about the bigger picture and getting people even who aren't libertarians necessarily to kind of ally with us on the big issues of our time i think it's really refreshing for a lot of people to hear and it's another area that was easy to monopolize on because there wasn't really a single voice out there that was focusing on just that so i was just at the right place at the right time uh with dave and he saw me pushing for it and then he kind of picked the banner up for it too and pushed it along and that's kind of how i blew up so it's yeah no i know it, it, it's great to see it, it you know and i tell people all the time this spot this space is not full not even close to being full it's like whatever your background is and whatever you know whatever you do if you can add a podcast to your life which is not a simple thing to do but it's also one of those things um that you know you can turn around and and do some really amazing things in terms of spreading liberty with and so i wanted to t- take a second and um and, and kind of get your your backstory i've heard a bunch of it i'm sure there's a lot of guys in the space that have um you your your run up to liberty i mean it was one of those things where i didn't realize you had worked with uh tulsi gabbard uh and uh you, you came up you know probably a lot like i did as a as a neocon i mean the whole oh, bush yeah. cheney man i was trying to go through some pictures today i've got this stupid one where i'm in a turret as a you know a young 20 something year old right with a bush cheney sticker on the turret and i was just like god almighty like if he's sharing this bush cheney sticker i, I might as well try to find one as well because you know it, we we it, it's a it helps tells the story of you know this reformation within inside your own you know your own mind your own soul uh to come really full circle into liberty yeah so i was i'm i'm younger than you so i was uh i think in that picture i'm 10 years old in 2004 but even at 10 years old i was interested in politics and i had you know i was on the wrong side obviously but i had this uh this bush cheney sign and I, i was always interested in it from a young age Uh, And then when I got into high school, I started studying history a bit more. um, And it actually turned me 
I kind of internalized my beliefs on uh, being a neocon because I, I was really into World War II and I bought into the propaganda that World War II happened because we weren't invasive enough in World War One. We didn't do enough to stop things from getting out of control. Uh, so I was like a big, I, you know, Bush and then McCain and then Mike Huckabee actually is the guy that I really liked in like middle school and early high school. And then in uh, 2012, I was a senior in high school and uh, I actually did kind of like Ron Paul. I wasn't really listening to the entirety of his of his philosophy, but I did like that he was one of those guys that said what he meant and he was obviously principled. And um, so he kind of caught my attention, but it, it wasn't enough uh, at the stage I was in life. It was really in like uh, 2014 after I graduated high school and I was working. Uh, when I'd get home at night, I started watching a lot of YouTube videos and uh, Rand Paul was actually the first guy who kind of caught my attention when he was filibustering John Brennan's nomination. Um, and then I started, uh, I found Peter Schiff in 2014. I, I found his video when he did Occupy Wall Street in 2010, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, when he was talking to all the guys who were protesting. Uh, and then I started watching Kerry Wedler uh, and then Bill Maher, actually, believe it or not, like even though he's an establishment hack in a lot of ways, he did kind of he did kind of pull me out of conservatism. He made I mean, he's one of those weird guys that he, he's horrible, but he makes like a really good point once in a while, you know. And yeah. um, so I just started watching all these different people. Uh, and then in 2015, I traveled across the country. Uh, I throughout 2015 and 2016, I went to all 50 states. Uh, and I had a couple different jobs in different areas, met a ton of different people, and I just blew my perspective out of the water. And so I just tried putting the pieces back together. Um, and I ended up becoming like a moderate libertarian in 2016. I voted for Gary Johnson. And then, like you said, I, uh, I worked for Tulsi Gabbard in 2020, even though I didn't agree with her on everything. Um, but then just seeing like how horrible the Democrats were to her, um, and how like hopeless it is to try to overtake this system. It kind of red pilled me as to like what a giant beast it is we're fighting. And then 2020 happened, you know, with the lockdowns and the bailouts. And, and I just like, I, I became a radical. <laughs> it's yeah. been a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. You and me both, man. Like 2020 was that year. I was just like, Oh, you know what? Uh, if they want to call us radicals, let's just own the whole thing, you know, like, fuck them. Right. Like, we're going to take this this thing back. We're going to have, you know, the, the, the language and the shows and everything else to do it. And I think it's it, I think it's amazing uh, to go from, you know, the 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 extreme, right? The, the Bush Cheney type. Um, and, and I mean, to, to I think it says something about you, though. I think it says they have at least an open mind. You know what I mean? And like the yeah. the ever present search where I think a lot of America gets shut down today is is around not having that open mind. Um, I imagine it serves you pretty well, you know, you know, running around the United States in a, in a truck you know, with all the different people you meet. I mean, I, I do the same thing uh, in, in this country and around the world. It's, it's that open mind that makes you a, a real asset to, to whatever you know people you're serving. Yeah, for sure. And I think that um, the reason people don't like talking with each other and they don't want to hear opposing opinions is because we've become so isolated that our ideologies are more fragile than they used to be when we had to talk them out. I mean, it, it, it's really an uh, it points to a, an intellectual weakness if you don't want to talk to somebody who might say something that sounds a little too convincing from a point of view that you disagree with. You know, like if, if you have actual strong beliefs, then you should be willing to go into the lion's den and talk to the polar opposite of whatever it is you think. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the biggest problems that has gotten us where we are now, because if you don't talk to people you disagree with and you don't think about anything, then they can lead us into a situation like we are now and nobody's questioning what's going on because they haven't been brought up with this idea of questioning anything. It's just like, take what you're given and go with it. And so if the, if the corporate media that you've been listening to your whole life is telling you what to do, you're just gonna keep doing it. You're not gonna question, you're not gonna take any second guesses, you're just gonna go along with it. And it's, it's really terrifying actually. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, that's the thing is politics is all I mean, it's completely centered around that kind of thing is a, a you know, somebody that's kind of seen it from a candidate's perspective when you won't be engaged by the, the duopoly candidates. Right. Like you like what? Why? What, what What are you so scared of? It's are, are we wasting your time? Is it your ideas are so superior to, to ours that you don't have to convince people? And that's basically, you know, what I've seen they've come to is like, listen, we don't care if we give away an election as long as we don't talk about you guys. Right. Like that's that's what happened down here in fucking Georgia this this past year. Oh, it's it's yeah. a, it's a mess. Uh, and, and the leadership, I mean, shame on them for for setting that kind of tone uh, where power is the the ultimate end goal. Um, I think I think we share a lot in common in terms of the want to bring um, a strong, extremely strong LP to the forefront in 2022 and going forward here. Um, the the unity movement that you've started inside of the LP here, I think is going amazing. Why don't you kind of tell everybody, you know, why and how? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's funny working on Tulsi's campaign. I, I, I disagreed with her on like, I don't 30% of the issues, you know, she was good on like social issues and most of foreign policy. And then she sucked on guns and most of her economics and the war on terror. So there, there was like a pretty sizable chunk that I really didn't really didn't agree with her on. And there were people from all walks of life on that campaign. There were like Republicans, socialists, like libertarians, anarchists. Like it was the craziest group of people. And we were all coming together around this idea that, you know, we want to end these wars. Uh, we want the government to stop spying on us and we want to respect each other as Americans again. It, it was it had to be like a really vague centralized message that we could gather around because we were all so different. And then I go into the Libertarian Party and, uh, you know, I'd kind of stayed away from the party just because I thought it was such a joke. But 2020 was so bad. I was like, OK, you know, <laughs> I've got to I've got to do something. I got to get involved here. So now you're in a party that everybody agrees, as at least as far as policy goes, like 95 percent of the time, probably like it's extremely high. Yeah. And they they hate each other. You know, like they're screaming at each other. They're eviscerating each other. They're yeah. treating each other like complete, like ideological enemies. And I was just like, guys, have you stepped back and looked at how much you agree on compared to everybody else in the country? And have you like taken a look at what's going on here? So, um, you know, there. I, I think that there are some bad actors in the Libertarian Party. Um, and, you know, they've exposed themselves a lot. And, and those people are pieces of shit and you know they they suck and you can't unite with people like that but if you have someone who just has a difference of opinion as far as what's important or what they care about you know we really shouldn't be making enemies out of each other we should be trying to unite on the big picture issues like ending the lockdowns ending the wars ending the bailouts and then you know if we have a difference of opinion on like whether transgender women should play on women's teams in sports or something like that's something we can talk about later. Like it's not the most important thing right now. Like most of them aren't even in school, like to play on the team. So like, why are we arguing about that? You know? Yeah. So I, you know, I kind of went through the same thing in coming over to the libertarian party. You know, I was taking a really, really hard look at it before I even thought about running in 2016. And I just, I couldn't get past like Nick Sarwak, man. It was one of those things where, I saw a guy and, you know, he I, I, I will I kind of try to lead with something good about people most of the time because I'm not a complete asshole like that guy can that, like that guy can run a, um, you know, a, a, a position in terms of being the chair in terms of a uh, what's the, the, the big gathering uh, boy off the top of my head. I've, I've lost it. But uh, convention, he can run a convention. Yep really really well right but when it comes to strategy and messaging like those i i that's what i found extremely re repulsive kind of off-putting um something that i thought was just very lukewarm and 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 not something that i really was like all right well you know why would i get into something like that um is that was that kind of your feeling as well yeah so 
you know, uh, I forget his name. He's from New Hampshire. The guy who was screaming about uh, driver's licenses and how we're going to have to have licenses for toasting toast in our own damn toasters. What, what's that guy's name? I forget. <laughs> all yeah, I don't know. You know who I'm talking about, obviously, though. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, that was my image of what the Libertarian Party was. It's funny, like, this whole dichotomy about, like, the alt-right and bigots and racists entering, like, that's never been something I was, that, like, pushed me away or anything. It's been, like, the joke aspect of libertarians like that's what that that's what i always thought and so and let's let's clarify that because somebody's gonna love that sound bit in a few years it's not the the racists and the homophobes and the bigots that drove you away listen what he's saying is and i don't gonna put words in your mouth this is like did it's not that those people even existed in the right. in this party right <laughs> exactly yeah they, they don't even <laughs> exist it's the uh, but somehow that's become the dichotomy. Like when I first started looking at the party, I thought the dichotomy, if anything, was going to be the serious people and the idiots. But somehow they've turned it into this civil war over like, oh, no, the right wing is taking over. And I'm just like, what are you guys talking about? Like that? I mean, it's just a, a non-existent threat. But that, that was what really kept me away was just the um, I guess the lack of focus on what matters. You know, it was this like this swinging with a hatchet approach just going at the state you know like in my opinion like you could you can actually that can be harmful if you don't deconstruct the state in the right way like a great example is uh with uh glass de gaulle you know they removed the uh they removed the um you know the campaign they, finance they, right yeah so the well the banks were not broken up anymore but the fdic remained so now you have the banks able to like get even bigger, but they still have insurance. So it, you've removed just a little bit of regulation. So you've actually made the problem worse and that like encouraged the housing crisis of 2008 and everything. So in my mind, if you don't, if you're not smart about what you're doing, then you're actually gonna cause more problems than you fix. But especially if you can't even get to that point because you're screaming about traffic lights or age of consent laws or I don't know, you know, just like completely abstract stuff that nobody who hears you is going to think, wow, you know, I really care about that too. And I want that taken care of right away. You know, you've got to, you got to be talking about stuff that people actually care about in their everyday lives. Um, so, you know, I, that, that's what was weirding me out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you, man. Like, do you see right now that the LP at national is still very much the same as it has been? And really what's happening is you've got a, a real movement uh, down at the, I want to say the, the, the grassroots type movement uh, s starting here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, when I first found out about the Mises caucus, I, um, uh, I, I don't I didn't really like Jacob Hornberger. I don't dislike him as a person. I just didn't like his uh, presentation because to me, he wasn't stressing the important issues. He was like, I mean, he had like Medicare at the top of his priorities, like getting rid of Medicare in a pandemic. And it was like, dude, like <laughs> you might want to be a little more judicious in what you decide to put at the top. Uh, so I honestly at first thought that the Mises caucus was like the joke wing of the party and you know it sounded like the pragmatist wing was more like hey we need to figure out on you know we need to figure out what's important and what to stress but the more i've found out about the mises caucus they actually are what i was looking for they, they want to push like five issues you know they care about wars uh you know um austrian economics uh property rights um you know spying the war on drugs like the, the kind of big ticket items um so, yeah, I'm actually excited to see what they've been doing. And I think that uh, the grassroots movement that is growing is kind of exactly what I've been hoping for. It's uniting on those really big issues and trying to get Americans who care about those types of things on our side. Because if we if we're just talking about legalizing prostitution or just talking about getting rid of um, driver's licenses or whatever, like we're not going to we're not going to attract many people to our cause. Now I, I tell people that all the time. I like, I've got some really good friends that are they're prags and all that kind of stuff. And they see the world a lot differently. Um, you know, like I, I'm not that smart, right? Like I'm a, I, I'm, I just 
I don't want to get into the the wonky policy crap, and I don't think most people do, right? Like, I don't think most guys in the Mises caucus, I don't think most guys or girls for that matter anywhere want to get down into the weeds of any of this stuff. What we're talking about is absolutely destroying it, getting rid of it. We're not talking about tweaking it. We're not t- talking about moving it around. Um, and I, I, I feel like that's where we, we kind of see some of our biggest gains in, in terms of membership, in terms of relatability, just you know good old-fashioned you know and i don't want to say like that and this thing is it's like it's an idea right it's not for just me and you some a couple of white dudes like we're all about like hey man if if you if you want to be free let's go man we can agree on some really basic issues yeah the other thing is um i feel like the word pragmatic is misused because people now think that pragmatism means moderation you know where pragmatism in in its true definition is actually important and i actually think that the mises caucus is pragmatic because they are putting the most important issues at the front and kind of letting the less important issues fall to the wayside and there are a lot of prags that i know who are doing the exact same thing you know like they're they're trying to say hey we need to push on these really important issues like in my mind radicalism and pragmatism actually need to go together because you need to be radical on the really important issues because that, that's what Ron Paul was like. You know, he he understood the issues of his time and he was not wavering on them, but he didn't talk about getting rid of food stamps like it wasn't a priority, you know, like he wouldn't get up there and say, I'm going to take them all away. You know, it was just he would talk about the Fed and he'd talk about the wars. He'd talk about the Patriot Act, he'd, you know, talk about corporate welfare, all those things. Um, because if you're, if you're, you know, if you're moderate, you're no good. Like you're not going to attract anybody because then you're just basically a warmed over Republican or a warmed over Democrat. But if you're crazy, you know, if you're just radical and you're not pragmatic, then you're like that guy with the, you know, the, the toaster licenses or whatever, and you're just not going <laughs> to attract anyone either. So it's like mixing the two together is what matters, I think. Have, have you found, I mean, and I know you guys, you know, don't hold back on, on your show. Um, the, <laughs> I mean, yeah. the natural, so for you guys, it, the natural capitalist, uh, capitalist is uh, Mr. Coverdale's show, right? And, and, and it's, I mean, it, they don't, you don't hold back. Have you found this kind of liberating, um, I don't know, th- this, this push into, I'm done being PC, like I'm, I'm outraged. I am going to talk about my feelings. I'm going to talk about my experience, and I'm going to talk about my interaction to this fucking murder cult. Like I, I hate these. Like they keep me up, man. Like I seethe about these kind of guys, right? And it's like it's finally so good to have people coming out saying, "Fuck it, I don't care." I don't give a damn what happens in terms of these people rejecting me or hating me or judging me. I'm going to speak what I've seen, what I've what I've dealt with my entire life. And that that muzzle, this PC bullshit muzzle that you guys have had on us where you've slaughtered millions of people and, and caged millions fucking more like I'm done. It is brass knuckle time and I'm going to work. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I was never really PC, but I've definitely unleashed a bit more. Uh, I think the turning point was that stimulus bill that they passed right before Christmas, because that really made me mad because they were using Christmas as a, uh, a tool to distract everyone and play on everyone's heartstrings and be like, you'll have your 600 bucks, you can buy your kids something nice or whatever. And then, you know, a 5,500 page bill that nobody reads gets passed almost unanimously after they have like four hours to read it. Two Democrats, 47 Republicans, and Justin Amash voted against it out of 538. And then Trump actually looked for a second like he was going to fight it. And I was surprised, but I was cheering him on the whole time. And then, of course, he just keeled and (laughs) he signed it. And then everyone just forgot about it like a week later. And that just blew my mind. I was like, did you guys fucking see what just happened? Like, that was, I, I don't know if I'm supposed $2 to Two trillion dollars, right? Yeah. Like two trillion fucking bucks. And then like, whoa, yeah. we've already done it once this year and we're going to do it again for almost what? Four trillion is what they're talking about. You're like, oh my God. I mean. I mean, if, at least if they were like sending it to the people in cash payments, like I could, 
I'd still be against it, but I would forgive it a little bit more. But when you saw where that money was going to like Egypt and Sudan and Israel and, you know, like, oh, oh my God, it was just like, <laughs> I mean, you broke it down. I, for, I forget now. I did a whole video on it, but I broke it down like how much the 600 bucks covered out of the bill. I mean, so much. It was a, a tiny little sliver compared to everything else they packed in there. And so after that, when people were not paying attention two weeks after that happened, I just sort of let loose. And there's been a lot more swearing and I've had like more <laughs> controversial guests on. I, I have Ryan Dawson on once a month. And it, I, I partially do that just to piss off the PC <laughs> crowd because they hate it so much. <laughs> But <laughs> I, and that's the best like you got listen man and i think you're doing some things really good in that uh in, in that space too and, and i think that's you know one of the things I, I try to tell guys that are coming into this is like man if you can have fun with this i don't give a shit man like you have some fun man like have some, like if you can be entertaining and have fun and present people with some some great arguments, logic, some people that you know are are absolute uh, you know pillars of this liberty movement, like Tom Woods, man, that was I mean great, great material. I mean super <laughs> awesome. Um, so you know, in terms of what you're seeing in America right now, you get to see, I, I'm, you you've probably seen a lot more of America than most people during the last year, I imagine. And what what's your take, man? Like, I mean, you're, you're out there and, and doing my travels pretty much stopped and, um, you know, they haven't really got back out on the road yet. So what, what do you think? Yeah. So I do Western state travel. So I've been all up and down, uh, the West, pretty much just West of the Rockies. Um, and Utah where I live is pretty free in comparison to other places. Like the mask mandates have been over for a few weeks, but even when they were in effect, like, I'd say they had like 50% compliance and no yeah. one was like freaking out about it. But uh, man, you go to, I was shocked. Like today I was in Arizona and it's still like, it's, uh, you know, 2020 over there. Like ever there, all the signs, like no mask, no service. Like everyone's still wearing masks. If you don't wear a mask, they glare at you, but they won't even let you in the stores. Like uh, in, in uh, New Mexico, they have guards at the like they have guards at the stores in some places that t check your temperature on your way in and then they give you the, if you because I, I, I wear a bandana if i have to have a mask on they wouldn't even yeah. let me do that i had to put uh an n95 mask on or not the n95 but the the, the, the surgical medical type mask jacket. yeah <laughs> they, they gave me one to wear and uh you know i mean it's uh, like with my job i got to do my job so i don't you know, if I if I punch someone in the face or something when I'm working on my job, I'll get my boss in trouble. So I just I'm polite and I just do it. But uh, in Utah, you know, when I'm on my own time, um, even when we had mask mandates, like I stopped, I stopped doing I, I stopped complying with them and, and nobody really cared. Um, but, yeah, it's weird, man. Uh, Nevada and New Mexico are the worst states I've been in as far as that stuff goes like they're. I mean, California is apparently really terrible, but when I've been there the last couple of weeks, uh, I didn't wear a mask and nobody really cared. Hmm. Um, but Nevada and New Mexico, they're they're Nazis about that they're, stuff. They're, they're really bought into the uh, the whole control thing, huh? Yeah, I don't know why. Uh, especially the, the Indian reservations, man. Holy crap. Um, and I think that's voluntary. The Indian reservations, they've been really tough on it, but they they still have curfews and stuff in some places with the with those it's it's nuts but i mean I, 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 i'll tell you what man you know if if anybody knows about getting wiped out by disease though uh, i imagine it's uh, you know the native americans yeah. and stuff out there and maybe it's just a an extra precaution um you know through you know what, what is it like epidemiology i mean it's like uh, to to be able to to hand this kind of stuff down um so, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of, you know, what I expected is there's going to be some states where most people are just like, we're, we're done. And in, a, in other states, you still have a, a high likelihood. And I guess it doesn't surprise me. You know, uh, Las Vegas is kind of one of those cities where, you know, when I visited um, the, the people who do some things out there, were looking for, you know, kind of like the Hollywood dropouts. Right. Like they're yeah. easy, easily manipulated, to, to, right. to say the least. Um, but do, do you feel like um, 
it's it's galvanized the country into camps or do you feel like maybe it's starting to to have the the backwards effect now that that people are seeing through it yeah i don't know like it's weird i guess both at the same time like yeah i think some people are gonna wear masks the rest of their lives and i'm not kidding like i think some people really will (laughs) just because (laughs) i mean they're yeah they they uh I mean, even if they think the coronavirus is going away, like this has just turned people into germaphobes in a lot of ways because they they think like, oh, my God, I can't believe I used to drink out of a water fountain. Think of what some guy, you know, might have as a disease and he might sneeze on, you know, like it's just opened their brain to all those other crazy things we used to do before we wore masks all the time. You know, so I, I think some people are they're they're screwed up forever. But, yeah, I mean, at the same time, the people who have had enough, they've really had enough. Um, and I don't know if, uh, I don't know if the country would go through it again as a whole. Like, I mean, I remember when this whole thing started, it was at least where I was, it was voluntary at first. Like people just were voluntarily not going to work and they were staying home and like, because no one knew what was going on. And then the government mandates came later. Um, Mm -hmm. I wonder how it would play out differently this time. I would obviously be doing everything I could to fight against it before anything happened because, you know, now we know what's coming down the pipe. But um, I, I, I feel like a lot of Americans would resist it if something like this were to happen again, I hope. But, I mean, they surprised me this last time around by how long they they, they kept tolerating it. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I'm extremely surprised at how how patient Americans have been. And I think, you know, maybe I've underestimated them. Um, I don't, I I think there's a lot of people that have just kind of like said, Oh, Americans are spineless. Now it's a different generation. They're, they're, they're ballless. They've got no fight left in them or anything like that. I, I tell you what, I really, really disagree with that notion. I I think that they've become extremely patient and, and war weary. Maybe, you know, like the, the idea that we've been at war for 20 plus damn years now, it's like, well, maybe they've seen it and maybe they know it and maybe they're listening to enough voices who have actually seen it in person to say, this is not what we want. This is, should be the, the last resort in terms of, you know, taking up arms against, you know, these tyrants. Do you think that's probably the case? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's funny. Someone, uh, Someone was talking to me about how they've made all these movies about uh, people rising up against tyrannical governments. And, you know, the younger generation is the one who's mostly been brought up in that. But it doesn't really seem like they're they're doing that, like they're not really resisting much. Um, It's weird, you know, like with all the riots that were happening last summer, there were a lot of, you know, early 20 year old people out there taking advantage of what was going on you know, with the property damage and looting and everything. And I mean, I, I grew up in a weird family. Like my, my parents were, uh, they, they really believed in self-reliance. So they taught us to be independent and to, you know, terrible people. Out. Yeah, I know to pull ourselves <laughs> up by our bootstraps. And we were doing stuff that other people our age would be terrified of doing just because we grew up used to it. Mm-hmm. But this whole, this apathetic, uh, uh, not apathetic, this pathetic culture that's uh, been stewarded over the last, like, I don't know, couple generations, I think it does play an effect. Like, I, I would kind of agree that these this generation doesn't have much fight. Like, it, it doesn't have much determination, not even just fight. Like, you know, none of them want to work anymore. None of them want to do anything themselves. They want everything handed to them on a silver platter. And in some way, in a lot of ways, they've been screwed over by the system with the government subsidizing student loans and everything and driving the price of college through the roof and making it hard to get a job or whatever. But at the same time, they really are just like super lazy and super, uh, you know, just, I don't know. They're, they're not inspired to do anything. They're not um, self-reliant at all. So I think we're paying the consequence for that now. Do, do you see that um, with uh, like people you grew up with? Do you see it just in general? Because I have had some people comment to me recently, you know, especially the guys that are entrepreneurs that have, you know, staffing uh, concerns and everything that they just can't get anybody to come in and work anymore because they're making more money on the outside, just getting a, a dole check from the damn government right now. Oh, yeah. Right now, it must be horrible. I mean, even before that, though, 
like uh, before I went into truck driving full time, I worked uh, on power lines back in New Hampshire. And it was insanely hard to try to find anyone qualified who could last more than a couple months. Um, but yeah, now that the government is paying people to stay home, like, <laughs> yeah, it's super hard. I mean, why, why work if you don't have to? And it, it seemed like an obvious problem from the get go. Like, how are you ever going to end this policy? You know, not just with, uh, not just with, um, paying people to stay home, but paying for people's rent, paying for people's livelihoods. Like, how do you ever end that? Like you, I mean, I don't know. Like we, we keep hearing about how, oh yeah, the moratorium is going to be up on this date and then this is going to happen. And it's, I don't know. Like, I'm interested to see how that plays out because that's very hard as a politician to cut the money flow off to your constituents if you want to get well, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> when I when I see that side of it, you know, I, I think I have the answer to how this all ends. Like I've seen seen and, and read a thing or two in my time and yeah, seems, right. you know, like the, the Roman Empire, the, the Ottoman Empire, the, the UK, you name it, man. Like it, they all end in financial collapse, right? It's like it's one of the things yeah. as Austrians that we've been screwing about for fifty years. It's like, hey, uh this uh, this dream that you guys were in, where you guys just kind of print more and more money and hand it out for free, and the breads and circuses, like this shit comes to an end. And when it does, it's hard for you people that don't have any skills, that haven't been doing shit. Like it's gonna be really, really rough for you guys. Um, good, good, good question. In terms of just um, you know, have you have you read into or looked at uh, any of the the UBI stuff that people are floating around out there? I gotta, I'll, I'll admit that when I first heard of it, I was, I thought it was interesting. So this was in like 2019 because I've wondered about automation and everything. And then I was like, okay, I've never heard of this. And being an open-minded person, I just wanted to look into it and hear what the ideas were. Um, and it sounded better than some alternatives. Like it sounded better than just like socializing the economy uh, because it was a, a little bit more free market of a system where you can use the money for whatever you want or whatever. But uh, I've completely rejected the idea, uh, what was it, last March when um, they did the CARES Act and it was 1200 bucks for every person or, or yeah, 1200 bucks for every person and how royally they fucked that up and how much money went to corporations and you know the military and everything. And I was like, okay, like regardless of whether or not you think this is an, a good idea in principle, like in practice, it's going to suck all the time. Like if this government is doing it, it's never going to be run efficiently. But then on top of that, yeah, I mean, I think this last year has shown that even if it were run well in practice, um, yeah, hey, this guy gets it. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know Matt Struck? Uh, I'm subscribed to him. I got to have him on my channel. So yeah, dude, help. you guys would have a really good time. <laughs> um, but even if it were executed well in practice, um, you would have the effect of people not wanting to do anything anymore. Like we're already seeing that play out. Uh, and that was a question I always had about it. And now it's just kind of been presented as that's how it would work. So I, I'm, I'm completely, you know, I mean, I guess Alaska has something that they do that's sort of like a UBI, but it's not really. It's their oil. It's right. like the money they make off of oil. It's not really a UBI. And then they, it's like $1,000 a year or something that you get if you're a resident. So, I mean, there, there are some like nuanced approaches to things like that, but a full blown UBI for everybody in the United States, I think it's a horrible idea, uh, especially in practice, but also in theory, because yeah, you'll just, encourage people not to do anything so, so yeah i was gonna say you know the, a lot of these early jobs that you have in life man it's like i know they suck man like i you said you worked uh for a power company up there what is a lineman yeah i was like an equipment operator pole setter and then i do some line where i kind of did a little bit of everything i was just an everything person i mean but. super grueling work man i used to work for georgia power down here reading meters in the summer and if they have like a bad storm or something you know go out with the line man i'll tell you right now man like like those early entry like those early entry jobs and and don't get me wrong like you can you can get paid 
working for the power companies like those guys need really good strong uh guys that are just willing to take a beating and and get keep going to the next job right but yeah. these these jobs that you know people just want to look down their nose at and reject and like god man i'll tell you what i don't understand that for the life of me in in this country i mean it, it, I, I guess my question, you know, if, if I had to, if, you know, UBI, I hear more and more people talking about, especially with the rise of crypto. But in terms of the government doing it, I, I don't think they'll ever approach it for everybody. I think they'll approach it for people who don't mind a certain level of living. You know, like that's a re really about the only people that are going to accept it, because let's face it, if you want to be really, really successful, the government is not going to get you there if you're just taking you know, a handout. So would you think hy super hypothetical as a really you know, like as somebody who's going out and, you know, providing and producing or uh, some product service um, if they got rid of taxes altogether for those people and s instead of a UBI and, and they presented a UBI, would that be, you know, something that's more um, palatable? Yeah, well, uh, you know, in 2019, I made 120 grand working at the power company and mm -hmm. like, I forget how much the government took like 25 grand or something like that. It was just gone. So if I had gotten UBI, I would have gotten 12 grand. But if they hadn't, um, if they hadn't, um, you know, taxed me at all, I'd still have that 25 grand. And I could have used that throughout the pandemic, like helping my family, helping my friends, doing stuff like that. But instead, you know, they took it and we saw all the useful stuff they did with it over the last year that really helped us out a lot, you know? So, yeah, I mean, like, even if the government could hypothetically redistribute redistribute it well, um, it's probably going to be better off in your own hands from the beginning where you already know what to do with it and push people in the right direction to get cash instead of just throwing cash at everybody and expecting people to still try to pursue the right career, or, you know, go where the money flows. Like, um, I, I think I, I, I agree with you. Like, why take the money in the first place? <laughs> just let this yeah work the way it's supposed to yeah but. you can print it anyway so i mean you don't yeah. it's not like you need to take it from us um <laughs> that's for damn sure so I, I would be extremely remiss you know we're getting into about the the last the last 15 minutes and i'm gonna this is either gonna strike gold or we are going i'm gonna have to shift my line of thinking altogether. today's may 4th right it's, it's star wars day Are you star wars fan at all i was so i, I know it very well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once upon a time you were a Star Wars fan. What yeah. what uh what genre of Star Wars? Uh definitely the older movies. Uh I liked um The Empire Strikes. Do you want me to like list them favorite to least favorite? Oh yeah, or? you know what listen, if you want to geek out on Star Wars, be it at May fourth, like I, I think this is something oh, okay. that we, we just owe to everybody out there. Yeah, I actually I, I I don't care anymore, but I still know a ton of useless information about Star Wars because when I was uh, I don't know when I was 14 probably I was yeah. obsessed with Star Wars um, but yeah I, I my fa I'd say The Empire Strikes Back is the best then uh, the first one Star Wars um, or A New Hope if A New you're, Hope yeah A New Hope uh, and then I really don't like Return of the Jedi though I didn't think that was a very good movie so I'd actually go Revenge of the or wait no yeah Revenge of the Sith and then Return of the Jedi, and then, oh man, they're all so bad after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Like the the prequels were awful, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the prequels were awful, but then I think the newest ones oh. were even worse. Like I, I was, I, I, I <laughs> so like I was kind of excited when the seventh one came out just for nostalgia, and then I went mm. and watched it, and it just like fell really flat. And then the the eighth one came out. That one was it was so bad. I almost walked out of the theater. I mean, it was just so dumb and so it was boring. terrible. <laughs> and I told myself I'm not even going to watch the last one. Like I have no reason to see it. And it came out. I didn't go watch it. I, I don't know how long it's been out now. But uh, this last uh, Christmas, when I flew back to New Hampshire to visit my family, the plane had movies you could watch. And that was one it's, of them. It's been parts. reduced to a shitty plane movie. Like, oh, I'm going to watch this anywhere else. It got me <laughs> captured here for fucking two hours. I might as well watch it. So I watched it and I was just like, man, like, <laughs> wait, I didn't wait, waste my money. <laughs> 
Oh, it's funny, oh, man. Um, so, I, I, do you have you have you tuned in to any of uh, the Mandalorian series? I haven't. I've been told I should. I mean, I'm not really a Star Wars fan anymore, but I've had a lot of people tell me like, you should check that out. You would really like it. And I've I've watched a few uh, clips of it, and it looks pretty good. Um, I did like Rogue One. I thought that one was it. It it felt like a Star Wars movie. You know, like the I felt Actual like the war. Yeah, like the new ones felt like an Avengers movie. Like it was just the the tone was off. It was just it didn't feel like Star Wars. But uh, I, I haven't seen Solo, and I did watch uh, Rogue One was pretty good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, The Mandalorian. A lot of people have told me I should check that out. So yeah. maybe I will. But. So, Solo was pretty trash, and I, I agree with you. Rogue One was one of actually when it came out, I was like, oh man, this is like top contender for like top three positions, right? Like this is a really yeah. good Star Wars. Um, and yeah, they trash you know the the prequels and they trash the the, the last three. Um, the Mandalorian though, surprisingly good. It's like. I mean, so so good, man. Like, I was just like, wow, this is kind of what I've been waiting for since I was a little kid. You know, like, everybody else kind of just missed the mark. I was excited, you know, when a, a series announced they were doing it and then come out and you'd be like, oh, boy, that sucked. And, it, you know, but then The Mandalorian hit, especially season two. Uh, so, I was just fantastic in terms of the you know what they're doing in production quality and storytelling and where they're taking everything and they, apparently they're going to go out maybe and, and and kind of do some retcon and cancel out a lot of what they did maybe in terms of timeline for the, the newer stuff i was i don't i think you'd enjoy it man i, I really do yeah. knowing knowing kind of how how you are and, and what you like it was uh it, it definitely uh changed the i i i guess it won't pursue the the that anymore in terms of but the the idea i guess that you know i think is really captivating out of star wars is the fact that you had a bunch of you know people who were really really tired of you know being put upon by the empire and they said screw this man like we're yeah. we're not gonna take this shit anymore but per, i mean overwhelming odds like but that kind of stuff sells yeah, I mean, I like how you tied it in in your introduction. You got a couple Star Wars clips there and, and the Empire when the Death Star blows up. I, I like it. And you're right. The other thing is, like, all the people in the Rebellion are so different from each other, right? They're not a monolith, but they're coming together because of this oppressive system that's destroying their lives. And that's what we got to do. Like, we got to, you know, if you're if you've got a different religion or different cultural preferences or different sexual preferences whatever like who cares like if we you don't want care to, if you if you want to dismantle the state then you're welcome here <laughs> you know like that's what we want <laughs> yeah we don't have to have a whole lot you know it's funny too is man as, as, as soon as you say this kind of stuff to people and they get it you, and and they see you roll around with this you know this group of people that looks like it's you know just I don't know, it, duct tape together at a hundred miles an hour going down the road. You know what I mean? Like it's the yeah. clamp. It's and, and, and boy, I'll tell you, like it's, it's some of the best times, best people, the conventions and you know, the, the meetups and everything else I've been to. If I'm trying to talk anybody in, you know, like I, listen, I'm a Mises caucus guy and I, I love what they're doing in terms of messaging. Um, this, this is where you're going to find some of the people I think you're going to know for the rest of your life. I think there's some people out there in the space that they are going to write books about here in the next couple hundred years. And man, I'll tell you what, don't engrave them on any fucking mountains, but you know what I mean? Like <laughs> not with state money anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, I I've met uh, really cool people here. Um, and it's, it's amazing to just be like, you know, having Dave on my show and then, Ryan and Pete and like all these people that you know some of them I've been watching for a few years and now I'm friends with them and chatting with them and doing video discussions with them it's uh, it's really surreal and I really feel uh, extremely privileged to be able to do it and I do think this is the most important cause of our lifetime because if it wasn't I wouldn't be wasting all this time on it because uh, as you know like doing this type of thing is a lot of work and a lot of effort and trying to make it look good and trying to you know, get people to watch it and everything. Like, I, I'm not making any money off this show. Um, so I, I do it because I want people to start thinking and I want people to hear what's going on. And I, I'm almost like a messenger. Like, I don't really want them to just listen to me because I'm just a, I'm just a regular guy who can tell them, hey, something's wrong. This is what's wrong. Listen to Scott Horton if you want to know more about, 
you know, the wars in the Middle East or listen to Peter Schiff if you want to know more about the banking, uh, you know, the, the bailing out the banks and how that's fucked up our economy. Listen to, you know, like just listen to these guys because they're the experts. I'm just the messenger telling you that things are bad. But uh, I do it because I care. And I know that's why you're doing it, too. And that's why we're all doing it. Yeah, man, I, I wanted to take these last couple minutes and I mean, it, it kind of point out to everybody like, look, Reed has taken the initiative to, to do something from from his place of work in his cab of his truck with, I imagine, minimal equipment, a cell phone and I don't know what. So, I mean, some power plugins and things like that. Yeah, well, I, I do it on my computer now just because the audio is so much better, but I'm using my cell phone uh, hotspot, so I have to have good service if I'm doing these things, and that that, that can be troublesome sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, that, that, that's, the, that's the, the point I wanted to make is, like, man, you know, don't think of it as, you know, I'm going to put out this, you know, product that nobody's going to want to see like somebody wants to hear you talk man somebody relates to you and if you've got some experience and you've got some humanity and you've got you know this this wanting to get out there and bust your ass like i think people really really enjoy those people who will grind for nothing man like just hey i got a passion in life i will grind my way through this as long as i have to until you know that state has either changed or morphed or is no longer existent and i'll tell you what kudos to you because i think you know it, most people don't spend their entire lives on the road you know what i mean it's yeah. actually uh, doing, you know, what you're doing in this Liberty space. I think it's going to be super kind to you. And uh, I, I think, you know, what that's going to transform into is one hell of a story to tell other people to get them off their ass to take action. Yeah. I mean, if I can do it with what I know and with my job, then you guys can do it too. Like that, that's what I want my inspiration to be. Like you hear Dave talk about how he's a comedian and he can do what he does. I'm a truck driver, like I'm way below his level and I'm doing it. So like if you if you're someone who feels like you have something to say, just start talking and start saying it and people might listen to you. You know, maybe not. Maybe maybe a podcast <laughs> isn't your thing and it's something else. But if you feel like you've got something to say that's important, never be afraid to because the worst thing that can happen is nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do they say? You know, e evil doesn't triumph because evil is awesome. Evil triumphs because good men and women sit on their ass and don't do a, a thing. Right. Like that's exactly. that's what it is. Well, yeah. man, um, let's let's give you a few minutes here. I want to give you the, the final word. I want you to plug everything uh, that uh, that you can uh, so that people can find you as well. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on, Shane. Um, I'm actually having you on my show on Thursday night. So everyone here come check that out we'll be live streaming uh i think at the same time at eight o'clock eastern standard time uh on my show and uh yeah my show is the naturalist capitalist right now it's just on youtube um i am planning on getting an audio version up soon and i'll probably uh be converting episode 100 forward to audio so you can listen to those um but yeah i have a lot of interesting guests coming up i got nick gillespie he's going to be coming on um, I'm going to have Dave Smith and Ryan Dawson and one of my other friends on at the same time. We do the four horsemen thing once a month. That's uh, that's pretty fun. Uh, but, yeah, I have all sorts of different people on. We talk about all sorts of different things. Uh, we talk about religion. We talk about culture. We talk about politics. We talk about economics. We talk about history. Like, I don't know, just kind of. It, it, wide range of things, but uh, the biggest goal is to just try to figure out what's true, what's actually going on. Um, and then, yeah, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Reed Coverdale. I'm the only naturalist capitalist and the only Reed Coverdale in the world. So if you search for either of those things, you'll find it me. pops right up. You got good <laughs> SEO, <right>. man. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, Shane. It was a blast. Man, I, I'm, I'm glad after months of trying to get this together, we finally did. And I uh, look forward to seeing you on Thursday, brother. All right, man. Thanks. All right. Take care. Peace. All right. Um, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff.